Okay, I think we'll start. I think people are still arriving, but we'll we'll get things underway. Um, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center uh, in um, a snowy, would you believe, Jerusalem. Um, uh, good evening uh, to everyone in Israel and Europe, and good afternoon to those of you joining us from North America. Um, some of you, I think, are regulars uh, to these um, sessions. Others, others of you may be new. Um, but this is, this is not only the latest in our special series of webinars that we've been doing at the Begin Center in collaboration with the Hidden Light Institute, which is leading up to a major international symposium about Menachem Begin, but this is also part of the Begin Center's commemoration of Menachem Begin on the anniversary of his passing 29 years ago. Uh, the anniversary itself was yesterday. Uh, today we'll be talking about a critical aspect of Begin's legacy, uh, what has come to be known as the Begin Doctrine, uh, a sort of uh, unofficial article of faith uh, which states that no country uh, which is committed or has committed itself to the destruction of Israel will be permitted to acquire the means to carry that out. And that all started with Menachem Begin's fateful decision to uh, bomb and destroy the Osirak nuclear reactor in Iraq in 1981. Uh, so we have two fantastic and uh, very um, uh, well-equipped speakers to, uh, to discuss the, this issue with us today. Our first speaker will talk about the event itself. Um, uh, in 1981, Menachem Begin's um, motivations uh, for his decision. And our second speaker will talk about the, the implementation of the Begin Doctrine uh, some 26 years later uh, by, a, by a future uh, Israeli prime minister and government. Um, after I've had a chance to speak to both of our speakers, um, I'll ask them some of your questions and you can submit those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So by all means, write, start writing as you're listening and I'll, I'll get to those um, after, after, I've, after I've spoken to, to both of our speakers. So um, our first speaker then is Herzl Makov, the CEO of the Menachem Begin Heritage Center um, and um, my boss. Uh, under, under his leadership, the Begin Center has grown to become one of the leaders in Zionist and democratic education, inspired by the values of Menachem Begin, serving thousands of young people and soldiers who participate in its programs every year course in uh, in the last year more online than uh, than in person of course um, prior to this uh, Herzl Makov was the chief of staff to Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir and was also director of the emissary department of the Jewish Agency uh, Herzl Makov was a major in the Israel Defense Forces serving in the Air Force as an air crew staff member and his squadron actually participated in Operation Opera uh, which was the, of course, the targeting of the Osirak nuclear reactor um, in 1981, which we'll be discussing. So, um, Hertzi, thank you very much for joining me this evening. Um, uh, you're, so you're on mute, Hertzi. Oh, thank you. Um, so, just uh, just to sort of set the set the scene for those maybe less familiar with the with the period, we're talking about a time when. Uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq was, uh, Saddam Hussein would, used to talk about Israel the way we now think of Iran talking about Israel, right? He was, uh, talked about um, drowning Israel in rivers of blood and all this sort of, this very sort of um, gaudy language that, the, that, uh, that sort of Arab leaders tend to use when talking about <laughs> destroying Israel. Um, so um, as, as someone who obviously who leads this institution, the Begin Heritage Center, and someone who has really, for so many years, um, been a devotee and a, and a, a student of Menachem Begin. Um, how do you how do you think about Begin's decision uh, to, to make to, to attack the reactor? What were his motivations? Um, Paul, as you uh, good evening, um, and it's uh, very nice to meet you in this uh, kind of uh, setup uh, and all of our guests as well. Um, as you said, uh, 
briefly about Menachem Begin uh, doctrine. Uh, in a way that sum up uh, the motivation. And I would just add another sentence to this doctrine. I mean, it, it was very simple. As you said, in one sentence, he, he uh, defines the, the doctrine of the security of uh, Israel, that we, uh, under no circumstances, will not allow the enemy of the Jewish people to acquire uh, an ammunition of mass destruction. And uh, if you want to say it's in two words, never again. Th that was where he's coming from. Mm. But there was another uh, statement by Menachem Begin when he said that when the enemy of our people uh, announced that he's uh, going to uh, destroy us or hurt us, uh, we have to take them seriously and act in order to uh, prevent him or them from doing it. And if you take those two sentences, you understand that uh, the, the decision in principle was very easy to him. It was very natural to go and to uh, uh, destroy after we have to remember that after all the diplomatic efforts failed, um, the, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein started his uh, effort to acquire a uh, nuclear uh, reactor in the uh, mid 70s. And until uh, 79, 80, there were diplomatic efforts towards France, Italy, Germany, that they were the, and Brazil, that they, that the main supplier was France, but the other three countries uh, supply some elements that enable uh, Saddam Hussein to uh, uh, upgrade the project to a military uh, project, not only a civilian project. As France said, that was their intention just to, to supply a, a civil project. So uh, Menachem Begin uh, came to the conclusion that there is no other option. Uh, we are not going to uh, allow, again, uh, Jewish children to be under the, the uh, threat of mass destruction. And, but if you go beyond that, you understand now that if we haven't done it, we uh, would let him acquire uh, the whole Middle East would be a different Middle East that we know today, because if that was the case, for sure, immediately, Saudi Arabia, uh, um, Egypt, uh, because uh, always there was a con uh, competition in the Arabic world uh, between uh, Egypt and uh, Iraq, for example, on the leadership of the Arabic world. So we would come to a nuclear race in the region, which of course would be a threat to Israel, but it would be a threat to the whole region and to the whole world. Right, which, which is also, of course, some, one of the issues that comes up today when we talk about Iran. Um, so, exactly. Where, I mean, this, this, whole, this motivation, I mean, that, I think that was, that's, really, um, that's really powerful, I think, with the, when, you, when you refer to the two word, the two word version of the explanation, never again, because clearly the Holocaust had this massive, impact on Begin. And there was other statement of Begin. Uh, you know, uh, his assistant told me that they were driving in the street of Jerusalem and they saw a bunch of uh, young children playing in a playground. And he said to him, Menachem Begin said to him, can I uh, uh, ignore the future of all the Sarlach and Mendelach and Menachemlech. He used the Yiddish term because the, the most of the Holocaust uh, victim were of course uh, Yiddish speakers. Can I ignore them? 
can I not do something to prevent uh, them from having such a future? Right. And it's, yeah, and this was, you know, uh, I think any, any biography of Begin that, that sort of has to, has to, um, to do justice to him, I think has to focus on the, the, the impact that the Holocaust had on his, on his thinking. Um, the, the international reaction was very, was very harsh, right, to the decision, including from the United States. Yeah. Um... Well, of course, you know, uh, some of them had a vested interest in that. Right. Friends, you know, I mean, they, they um, in a way, uh, you know, before we attacked there, the Iranian tried to attack this reactor twice. Mm. Uh, it was the time uh, when they had the Iran-Iraq war. Right. Uh, when Saddam Hussein tried to, he thought that there is a new regime in Iraq, in Iran, Khomeini just took power in, in 79. So he thought, it, he thought Saddam, it's a good opportunity. The Iranian told him differently or learned him, uh, taught him differently. Uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, by the way, when Menachem Begin was asked about this war between Iran and Iraq, he said, I wish success to both sides. Um, so they tried twice, so most of the French technicians weren't on site because they were afraid from another attack from Iran. Uh, but the Iranian missed the, the, the target and, couldn't, and didn't do uh, any harm. So of course the Arabic world uh, were against and uh, very loudly. And uh, the UN, of course, were against it. And even in, as you said, in the Reagan administration, uh, elements that were not happy with Israel to start with, like the Vice President Bush and the Defense Secretary um, Weinberger, they took opportunity to say that Israel did uh, um, coordinate there was, by the way, uh, um, kind of uh, miscommunication between Israel and the US, uh, which has to do with the fact that this issue wasn't handled uh, uh, right in the transition of the administration from the Carter administration to Reagan administration, but I won't go into it. Israel, we understood that we have a green light to do what we think we should do but we didn't coordinate for sure uh, with them. And um, so uh, again, Bush and, and uh, Weinberger that had in mind for a while to sell to Saudi Arabia, the F-15 and a few AWACS um, uh, early warning airplane, uh, they took advantage of uh, uh, this opportunity and um, uh, Israel uh, got an embargo for a while, for the freeze of, of uh, buying new weapon. Uh, it, uh, it was taken off a few uh, weeks later, but what is interesting is that uh, a couple of months later, uh, McFarlane, the national uh, security advisor to President Reagan came to Israel and he met with the Prime Minister Begin, and uh, towards the end of the meeting, he said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I have a special uh, uh, personal message from the President. So Begin said, sure, go ahead. He said, no, no, I have to do it in private. There were two aides of Menachem Begin in the room. So Menachem Begin said, you know, those people I trust, like um, uh, it's myself. Um, and if you can't say it in their presence, um, you, you, you don't have to say it. So McFarlane uh, sought for a second and said, okay, the president said, well done. Interesting, interesting. And then of course, 10 years later, when the US is, 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 um, is, is getting, trying to get Iraq out of, out of Kuwait, 
there's that famous, uh, I think Dick Cheney, who was then defense secretary, writes, right. writes, a, writes a letter to, uh, to uh, David E. Vrie, uh, who, was, who, who had been head of the Air Force in 1981, saying, uh, thank you very much for, <laughs> for, getting, for preventing Saddam going nuclear. For, for do, he, said, he wrote, for doing our job, job much more easier. Right. And he wrote it as a dictation on a, a big picture of the ruins of the, the reactor. Nice. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask you also, because you were, you, as I said in my introduction, you were part of the squadron involved in the, in the operation. Um, what can you tell us about the operation itself? Um, is it true that the, that the mission was so top secret that even the pilots didn't know until the last minute where they were going? Not the last minute, but uh, during the pr preparation, um, um, they haven't been told the, the, the mission. And uh, in the beginning, they were told I, I wasn't uh, uh, on a fighter plane. I was on an uh, early warn warning and control airplane. Uh, but the, the fighter, because when they had to do the model and to do all the training, they have been told that they have to uh, attack and target in a radius of a thousand uh, kilometers, it was uh, like 600 nautical miles. Uh, so of course they, they took, a, um, you know, like a, the radius and so around Israel, what kind of targets and some of them already figure what they're talking about. Then they uh, have been told that they are going to attack uh, an airport in Iraq, Khabania. Um, but quite a few months before, and, and you have to remember that uh, due to some circumstances, uh, we had to uh, delay the, the operation twice. Uh, it was uh, supposed to be in uh, April, then in May, and then at the end we did it uh, on June. Okay, yeah. It's a, I mean, I can only imagine the <laughs> how the the extraordinary nature of, of the operation itself. And I, was it was it delayed partly because was it delayed partly because it was um, there was concern that it was being leaked. I think the Shimon Peres was leader of the opposition. And he found out about it before Begum wanted to find out about it. Or there was there was definitely some internal political stuff going on, right? No, Be Begin uh, informed and update uh, Shimon Peres and Rabin as uh, Shimon Peres as the, the head of the opposition. Uh, Rabin is uh, part of the opposition, but uh, 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 prime minister. Um, in the past, he uh, told them about, of course, they knew that because the, the uh, reactor was uh, built during uh, the uh, term of Rabin and Paris as the uh, Minister of Defense. Uh, and it was one of the things that uh, during the transition, Rabin told Begin about it. But when there was a decision uh, to attack, Begin updated them but he didn't tell them the date. Uh, the first time that it was delayed was because of weather. Uh, there were clouds over uh, Baghdad, over Iraq. Uh, and um, we, um, at that time, we didn't have, have what we called, you know, uh, sophisticated uh, bombs. It was, you had to have uh, an eye contact with the target. Uh, and if there are clouds, uh, of course, there is no eye contact. So it was delayed once because of that. And the second time, on the day that the, the, uh, we had, uh, we were supposed to take off, actually, uh, some of the plane were already on the runway. Begin got a letter from Shimon Peres, urging him not to do the operation uh, because it's going to have uh, uh, uh consequence that we won't be able to uh, observe and the whole world and so and so and israel will become a desert he used the terms from uh, the bible um so begging uh 
became concerned. He said, not because he thought that Paris is going to, to call Saddam Hussein, but if Paris heard it, who knows who else heard it? And of course, you know, to send eight airplane to Iraq, you know, it's um, about a thousand kilometers away from Israel. Uh, it, it, it was a very risky mission. Uh, you know, uh, if God forbid something happened, if you and you have to send a helicopter to rescue, it will take the helicopter three hours just to get there uh, to the um, to the um, fighter airplane. It took almost an hour uh, flight. So a helicopter, of course, uh, and of course it, it, it was very uh, risky mission. Thank God. Uh, we came out of it with uh, no uh, injuries at all, uh, but Begin was worried. So we canceled uh, at the last minute because of the leak to Shimon Peres. Huh. Nowadays, we know how the leak uh, happened, by the way. Um, my last question for you. Um, as, well as, obviously, as well as opposition from Shimon Peres, who was in the opposition, was was it was it also difficult for Begin to persuade members of his cabinet? Because Begin was famously, he always saw himself as first among equals. He believed in cabinet decision making, that he was he was a prime minister, not a president. Um, what, did he have to convince people? Because I imagine there would have been concerns about, amongst other things, that it might affect the peace with Egypt. Yeah, uh, Begin in that case, uh wanted to get to a consensus, not only to a majority in the government, in the cabinet. Wow. He had uh, uh, immediately a majority, but uh, two senior members of the cabinet, which represent other parties than Begin uh, party, it was Igal Yadin from the democratic movement, and he was uh, chief of staff of Israel during the independence war. Um, and Yosef Burg from the religious party. They were reluctant, um, mainly because of the risks uh, and uh, because of the uh, uh, implementation of the peace treaty with Egypt, as you said, and, and maybe other uh, considerations. Uh, so Begin um, made a very, uh, sorrow process of decision making with the government. For example, he brought to the cabinet meeting uh, all the, 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 the heads of the intelligence branches. Um, and he let those who were in favor and those who were against. And there was uh, even opposition in the uh, intelligence community as well. Uh, the head of the intelligence in the army was against. His number two was very much for the uh, uh, attack for the operation. And Begin brought both of them to the cabinet meeting. And then after he saw, he saw that uh, um, uh, Minister uh, Yadin and Mr. Borg are uh, against, he sent uh, the chief of staff Raful and the commander of the Air Force, David Ivry, General David Ivry, uh, to a private meeting with them to convince them. Uh, and he got a consensus uh, towards the end. Wow, that's, uh, that's no small thing in an, in an Israeli coalition, uh, an Israeli coalition. <laughs> and imagine it was kept secret. Wow. Um... Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Herta Muckel. So we, we'll we'll definitely hear more from you when we get to questions. Um, and I'm going to turn now to Jakob Katz, uh, our second speaker, who is editor in chief of the Jerusalem Post and author of Shadow Strike: Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power. He's also the co-author of Weapon Wizards: How Israel Became a High-Tech Military Superpower and Israel versus Iran: The Shadow War. Uh, Yaakov served for close to a decade as the Jerusalem Post military reporter and defense analyst, was a lecturer at Harvard University, where he taught an advanced course in journalism, and he also served as Israel correspondent for Jane's Defense Weekly. 
Uh, prior to taking up the role of editor-in-chief, Yaakov Katz served for two years as a senior policy advisor to Israel's Minister of Economy and Minister of Diaspora Affairs. Uh, in 2013, uh, he was one of 12 international fellows to spend a year at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard University. He's originally from Chicago, and he also has a law degree from bar -Land University. Welcome, Yaakov. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, as well as the, uh, the obviously, the, the Begin Doctrine being so relevant, very relevant for, for the, the topic that you wrote, that you wrote about, in Shadow Strike, another connection that I found was um, Dick Cheney, who I mentioned uh, before uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, thanking, uh, thanking Israel for destroying the rights reactor. He also wrote on the back of your book, at least in the copy that I have, um, after serving as Vice President uh, George Bush, uh, that the book is a, a blueprint for how countries can and should act when faced with a threat of an existential nature. Which I, also, which I think is a nice allusion to the, to the Begin Doctrine in, in, uh, in many ways. So um, uh, this, this happens in 2007. Um, I believe in, uh, is, it, is it March 2007? September. Sorry, September 2007. March 2007, I think, is when, is when they, uh, they, they- It's they pretty probably... much March is when Israel discovers that something right. is happening in Syria. When they get that those initial pieces of intelligence that are basically the smoking gun that Bashar al-Assad is building a nuclear reactor in northeastern Syria. Okay, and and seven months prior to that, Israel had been in the second Lebanon war. Uh, Ehud Olmert right. was very much uh, a sort of under uh, under pressure prime minister. Uh, he was the war was regarded as a failure. His reputation was was being battered by the public, and he had legal <laughs> legal problems as well, criminal investigation. Um, so can you set the scene for us that this is, I know in, I, from reading the book, I know the, the, the research that you did included also many, a lot of time spent talking to Ehud Elmer himself. What, can you, can you set the scene for us? What was, what was going on in the prime minister's office when this, when this, uh, this yeah, bomb well, uh, so, so first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all on the, on the Yort site, I guess, of uh, Menachem Begin 29 years ago, and to talk about really such an important topic, and, and, and also to remember Menachem Begin at a time when we in Israel are, again, in our fourth round of elections in the span of two years, and to recall once upon a time different leaders that this country once had, but we'll leave that, put that aside for a moment. Um, I, I, I'll be happy to set the scene, but just before that, you mentioned uh, Dick Cheney, who, as as Herzl, as Herzl mentioned before, played a role as the Secretary of Defense. And, and I've actually been in Deputy Ivory's office and seen that photo of the the bombed out reactor with the with the inscription from uh, the from from Dick Cheney. But Ivory also played a role in 2007 because when Ehud Olmert had to come to the decision of what to do. He had to think back, who, who's, who's done this before, right? And, and really in the whole world, there was only one commander of an air force that had ever bombed a nuclear reactor in another country and that was David Ivory. So David Ivory ended up participating also and, and in, in those discussions that the prime minister convened every once in a while. And of course there was Dick Cheney who at the time in 2007 was the vice president of George W. Bush. But just to, to, to yes set the scene, we're, we're talking about uh, March, 2007. Israel is uh, seven months after a bad war in Lebanon, a war that ends, which now we have the retrospect of uh, over 14 years, where we can look back and say, you know, actually this created a quiet. Yes, Hezbollah has now built up a formidable force that it did not previously have, but but it had. But we have had almost 15 years of unprecedented quiet along the border with Lebanon as a result of that war. But back then it was a, it was a war with 122 soldiers who were killed, two of them still being held as captives at the time by Hezbollah, over 60 civilians killed, and 4,300 rockets that had pounded Haifa north, northern Israel had been turned into a ghost town, Israel at the time not having Iron Dome. Uh, Israel was battered and uh, the war ends. And there are demonstrations outside the prime minister's office calling for Prime Minister Omer to step down. At the same time, the old prime minister, similar to some extent to what we have today, uh, is under investigation, uh, numerous investigations, which we all know culminate in uh, the prime minister's resignation, his indictment, his conviction, and he ends up getting sentenced to jail and serves a uh, two year plus, almost two years, I think, sentence in uh, Masiao prison near Ramla. Um, 
But in March, Israel had had these suspicions that something was happening in the nuclear realm in Syria, but it couldn't put its finger on it. And it was a joint effort of military intelligence, was known as Agatha Modi'in, the military intelligence division of the IDF, together with the Mossad. And uh, it was unclear. We knew, for example, that Syria had a nuclear reactor which had purchased from the Chinese back in the 1990s, had a staff of maybe just about a dozen people. But, uh, but nothing of the capacity to be able to create a weapons program. And Israel would follow that, but there was something happening. There were connections with North Korea, there were connections with Pakistan. There, there was something that was happening, but they couldn't put their finger on. And in March, <clears throat> excuse me, Ibrahim Otman, who was the uh, Syrian head of the Atomic Energy Commission in Syria, a well-known nuclear scientist, physicist, was traveling to Vienna, which is the headquarters of the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Nuclear Watchdog, the IAEA, for just regular meetings. And the head of military intelligence, Amos Yadlin, at the time in 2007, who back in Hertzi's time in 1981, was actually one of the pilots of the F-16s that bombed the OCRAC reactor outside of uh, Baghdad. Fast forward to 2007, he now is the head of military intelligence and he goes to Mayor Dagan, who was at the time the head of the Mossad and says, I wanna, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanna send agents to track Ibrahim Othman and to see if we can gather some intelligence from him while he's in Vienna. And Dagan was actually a, a bit resistant because in the past the Mossad had tracked Othman around the world. They had pickpocketed that, you know, basically looked in his pocket, looked in his briefcase, looked in his hotel room. They always came back empty handed. They thought it would be a waste of time. And anyhow, for Dagan, Iran was the primary issue. And the thought of a nuclear program in Syria in our own backyard was just delusional, right? I mean, it was, and we didn't know about it. But in the end, he convinced him, he said, look, do it for me. If, if, if nothing comes of it, we'll put it to rest, but you never know. So the Mossad agents go there and actually the night of that operation in Vienna, there was actually another Mossad operation that was going on in another part of Europe. And this one in Vienna was considered to be really just nothing of importance. But that night the, they hit a jackpot and uh, Otman had left his laptop computer in his hotel room and the Mossad agents were able to download the contents of his computer and bring them back to Israel. But just to give you a sense, Paul, of how they thought they wouldn't find anything as they bring this flash drive back to Tel Aviv, the Mossad gives it to the military intelligence guys and they put it on a shelf for about two weeks and they don't even look at it. And then two weeks go by and someone one day says, hey, whatever happened to that flash drive, right? With the stuff from the Vienna operation. And they, they download it and they're blown away. Because on, on Otman's computer were pictures of a nuclear reactor being built in Northeastern Syria. They could see the structure of the reactor, the fuel rods, the core of the reactor and the kicker was a picture of Otman posing in front of the reactor, the building which was going to house the reactor, together with a man who was wearing a blue tracksuit who was of Asian ethnicity. And the, 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 the Israeli intelligence folks were, who is this Asian guy? And they go through their database and they discover that this was Chon Chibu. Chon Chibu is the head of the Yongbyon nuclear complex in North Korea. So not only, are we talking about a nuclear reactor being built literally in Israel's backyard, not a thousand kilometers away, like in the case of OC Rock, but also being built for Syria by one of the greatest threats to the world, North Korea. You mentioned before Prime Minister Olmert's investigation. So Dagan brings this intelligence to uh, Ehud Olmert, lays out the photos on the desk at the Prime Minister's office, starts describing what they're seeing, there's a knock at the door and uh, Omert says, go away, but the knocking persists. The meeting that took place that day at about 6, 6.30 in the evening. So that's close to our 8 p.m. Uh, news, right? Every, everyone knows in Israel, 8 p.m. is the big news show. And uh, opens the door, Omert's spokesperson and says, channel, then it was channel two, now it's channel 12. Channel two is going to broadcast uh, uh, a story of how you, there's another investigation <laughs> against you, right? So, I mean, just imagine the scene for a moment. Here you are, the prime minister of Israel. You've just received intelligence that literally changes the world for you. It, your, one of your enemies is developing a weapon that has the capability to pose a threat to you. And um, 
at that same time, there's a knock on the door telling you that uh, you have another report against you. Th th this was the scene going in to this whole uh, episode. This is extraordinary. And, and, and I, I, in commending your book to, uh, to, to our, our, our viewers, I, it's, it, it's told, it really reads like a, like a thriller. Um, <laughs> when, um, I mean, one of the, one of the differences, um, or one of the compelling aspects of your book uh, is the is what it reveals about the U.S. Israel relationship? I think because um, especially when you have a as you had then um, a U.S. administration and an Israeli government that really did have a high level of mutual trust and mutual respect, the Olmec government and the Bush administration, um, uh, and as we heard um, earlier in eighty one, um, Israel wasn't coordinating things with the U.S. Um, and there was opposition from within the administration, although in the end, Reagan, it turned out Reagan did, uh, did sort of um, quietly approve of, the, of, of what Israel had done. Um, but in this occasion, um, can you tell us something about, because uh, it's, it's it's there's some extraordinary scenes told in the book. Can you, can you just tell us something about how Bush and his senior advisors reacted first to the news of the intelligence, this bombshell of, of, the, of the intelligence that Mayor Dagan brought to Washington, and then how they reacted to Olmert's decision to strike. Right, well, if we compare again to 1981, there was a stark difference in 2007. And, 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 and Hertzi spoke about this earlier, was that Israel, this was a huge secret, right? No one knew of Israeli plans back in 1981 to bomb the Osirak reactor. Definitely, it wasn't something that was shared with the Americans. And that's why Israel was condemned at the time, right? There was a UN Security Council resolution against Israel. Reagan, who privately expressed his support for it, postponed the delivery of fighter jets to Israel at the time in, in, in response to the, the strike that Begin carried out. In 2007, Olmert decided very early on to bring the intelligence to the United States. And you mentioned Dagan comes to Washington, meets with his with the head of the National Security Council so at the time with Steve Hadley, meets with Dick Cheney, meets with um, the head of the CIA, and basically gives them this information. They're, they're, they're blown away, but they immediately uh, embark on their own process to validate and verify the information and also start to think up what, what are their options, right? This is not just a problem for Israel, obviously, it's a problem also for the for world, for the global community for the world. And uh, just like Israel created a bunch of different options, so did the Bush administration. But we'll, we'll skip over that part for a moment. What, 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 what I think Olmert was trying to do at the time was he had really two ambitions or motivations to get to, to bring this when bringing this to the Americans. The first was because of, as you mentioned, we were just seven months after a bad war in Lebanon. And that was against a Hezbollah. Hezbollah at the time, not like it is today, a small guerrilla organization with maybe 15,000 rockets. Syria, this is Syria pre-civil war. This is Syria with a very large military, a formidable military, stockpiles of biological and chemical weapons, hundreds of Scud missiles capable of striking anywhere inside the state of Israel, right? More tanks than we have, more soldiers than we have. We have, we have aerial superiority. We, I, Hopefully we would have won, if God forbid, a war against them, but the last big conventional military that still posed a threat to Israel. A war with Syria that could break out after an Israeli strike against the nuclear reactor in Syria would be nothing compared to the war that had taken place in the summer of 2006. Olmert wanted to try to avoid that, and an American strike against the reactor might see retaliation against Israel, but not at the same scale. That was motivation one. Motivation two was that we're the usual suspect. If Israel attacks the nuclear reactor, it's, yeah, expected. We discovered it, it was a top secret. No one knew about it. Assad kept it a secret, even from some of his closest advisors at the time. But if Israel attacks, that's, that's very much expected. If America attacks, the message that would then be sent to Iran, which everyone at the time viewed as the greatest threat with their pursuit of a nuclear capability would be far stronger and create such a greater deterrent for the Ayatollahs as they try to continue to pursue a nuclear weapon. Those were his two motivations. That's, that's important to keep in mind. But eventually in, in 
it, when Israel, and there's a lot of discussions that go back and forth, but Bush decides to take his time to consider his options in July of 2007, after a few months of deliberations and debates within the administration of what to do. Cheney, by the way, was a big proponent of the US uh, attacking. Hmm. He was the lone voice within the administration. Condoleezza Rice was opposed to it. Bob Gates was opposed to it. Uh, the, the, the intelligence community was very hesitant. And this was because they had been burned in, nine, in, in 2001, uh, I'm sorry, in 2003, when they go to war against uh, Iraq, against Saddam Hussein, on the basis of weapons of mass destruction, which were never discovered. And to now go to another, to attack another Arab Muslim country because of intelligence provided from a third party, AKA the Jewish state of Israel, might not have looked good for the Bush administration in his second term in office. So, so this, was, this was a big concern for them. But um, so Bush ultimately debates the issue July of 2007, I think it was a Friday, July 13th, if I recall correctly, calls up Ehud Olmert and says to him, you know, I've decided I'm not gonna attack. I, I have a diplomatic option. I'm gonna send Condoleezza Rice to Jerusalem. You'll hold a press conference with her. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll reveal the existence of this, of this reactor to the world. We'll take it to the IAEA. We'll take it to the Security Council. We'll hit them with sanctions. We'll demand it be dismantled. And then if they don't do it, we always reserve the right to attack. And Olmert on that call says to George W. Bush, this is unacceptable, Mr. President, um, and goes on to basically lecture him of how I, as the Prime Minister of Israel, carry the, the burden of the survival of the Jewish people on my shoulders. And if you will not attack, I will attack. And then the conversation ends, okay, Bush puts down the phone and Steve Hadley, who was on the call listening on the American side, as well as Elliot Abrams, who was Steve Hadley's deputy national security advisor, was also on the call. Both of them were very nervous that Bush was going to blow up at this chutzpah by the uh, Israeli prime minister. I mean, again, the superpower and little Israel. And uh, instead, Bush puts down the call and you know says, "Wow, that 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 pretty much along the lines of that guy. That guy's got guts, right? Said a little differently, but but that was his um, that was his the way he ended that call. Now, fast forward a few months to September of two thousand and seven. And I think this story has always stuck with me when I think of the, the conversations that they had. So Israel attacks on September 6, 2007, just after midnight. The attack is not like the one in Iraq. It's not as far away. It's not as complicated. It's over the border. It's impressive, but it's not a, a crazy operation in itself. Um, but they, they, it's a success. They, the planes land back. They, Israel waits to see if Assad's going to attack and war will break out. Thankfully, it doesn't. And Omer figures now's the time to call it Bush. Bush at the time was in Australia attending a, the meeting of APEC, the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation Group. And it takes a while to the White House can connect him on a secure line. He's in Sydney. Finally, they get him on the phone. Olmert says to the president, Mr. President, how's Sydney? Great weather. How's it going down there? And the president says, good, but you know, what do you, what do we, we, we're not here to talk about the weather. Um, and Olmert says, do you remember, he, he was being careful, he didn't want to reveal too many details, he didn't know who might be listening. Do you remember that thing up north that bothered us? The president said yes. So Olmert said, I want you to know it no longer exists. And Bush said, oh, that's very interesting. Do you expect a response? And Olmert said back to him, for the time being, it does not look like there will be a response. And he was certain that that would be the end of the call. The president's busy, so, you know, Sydney, Australia has got you know, more important things to do is just a quick update. And Bush surprised him and said to him, I want you to know that if there will be a response, all of America will stand behind you. And when I heard of this call, and it was then later confirmed for me by other people, um, to me, what, what, what really grabbed my, my attention was the fact this was a phone call that had never been published. No one knew about it. It was one of many phone calls that take place between Israeli prime ministers and presidents, although for the last month, there hasn't been a phone call between an American president and an Israeli prime minister, but we'll put that aside for another time. Um, but uh, but it was just one call, but, but look at what it carried with it, the significance, right? Here's an Israeli prime minister who just takes action from a place of vulnerability, does not know how it will end, does not know if war is going to break out, and gets told by the most powerful country in the world, by the leader of that country, I stand behind you. That, that, that shows something about the resilience of this relationship between Israel and the United States. By the way, like I mentioned before, 
they disagreed. Bush did not agree with what Omert wanted to do. Bush wanted a diplomatic option. Omert went with the military option. And despite that, you see the, the, the resilience and the strength of this alliance. Wow, that's a, that, that is, it's very, um, it's impressive. And it's, I think it, it also, it also poses questions about future, you know, future, subsequent relations between other presidents and prime ministers. I'm thinking, uh, there, there, I, I wanna get to questions from the audience and there's a bunch of questions about Iran which I want to, uh, which I want to put to both of you, um, but maybe I'll just ask you this, Yakov, and then and then ask Kurtzi one of the questions um, uh, that we've been given. Get, in in the book, you talk about um, you draw some comparison with the debate in the Israeli in the Israeli government of two thousand and ten about whether to attack Iran. And obviously, this is a this is the, the, the subsequent government of, of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Ehud Barak is the defense minister. Um, do you think that? If relations had been better between Washington and, and Israel at that point, there, it would have been a different scenario. Because obviously, things the, the, it would be fair to say the relationship between the Netanyahu government and the Obama administration were not the same as the Olmert Bush uh, relationship. I mean, it, it's a good question. I don't know, right? I, I think that one of the important elements of the story of, of Syria in 2007 was the fact that there was this close relationship between Bush and Olmert, and, and that, that played a, an important role here. There were, there were parts of the administration, um, particularly Bob Gates, and I tell the story in the book, who, who comes to Bush and says, you can't let Olmert do this, right? You have to stop him. Um, you, you, you can't let the, the Israelis lead us and tell us, you know, and decide what they're gonna do on their own. And Bush refused to do that. And, 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 and that took a guts. While Bush might've been wrong, if I were to look back and think about his decision not to attack, but but uh, but at least he, he he understood that you can't stop the Israelis. If you know, one thing that I just will say about about Netanyahu and Obama was I, I I it's hard for me to see how that the hostility in that relationship benefited Israel, right? And I think that one of the things that we see today, if we look at what's happening right now with another Democratic administration now in power in office considering returning to the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal, or trying to negotiate a different variant of that deal. And to already come out with, with uh, very aggressively, I think, like the chief of staff did recently, Abib Kohavi, against that deal without giving an opportunity to try to work with the administration and see if we can maybe influence the process that is taking place, in my opinion, is a mistake. Right. And I think that what that might have been one of the mistakes that happened back in 2014, 2015. Now, it's hard for me to tell you, though, would the Obama administration have been willing to give Israel a seat at the table? It's possible they wouldn't have, because as we know, famously, Obama wanted to create daylight between the United States and Israel at the time. So that was maybe different. But I think that now if we apply all of these models, 81, 2007, 2015, to where we are today in 2021, I think that the most important step for us to take today is to try to influence this process, try to play ball with the Biden administration, try to see, steer it in a way where it would be to our benefit before we start the saber rattle. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Hertzi, uh, there's, there's a, there are a couple of questions um, which I want to put to you. One is a very simple question, which is, and I don't know if you want to have a go at answering this, but what would, what would Begin have done in relation to Iran today? Well, uh, I uh, usually tend to say that I don't know what Begin would have done uh, because he was uh, a man who thought, uh, had his own uh, view of the world, and of course, circumstances are different. So I can't speculate. I can't tell you what I told you. What was his principles? What, what he said, not what, what he would say. Uh, I believe that the doctrine that he uh, put on the table and which uh, uh, in a way uh, was in front of uh, Prime Minister Eud Olmert and was in front of uh, 
Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, when he uh, uh, made the decision or tried to uh, be ready, uh, that doctrine was in front of them and was the inspiration for them uh, as well. But the, the whole situation with Iran is very different from uh, what we had in 81 in Iraq. It's a completely different uh, circumstances and uh, strategic aims and uh, uh, different kind of weapons. Everything is, is uh, different. Um, if I just may, I, I want to make just one comment about the previous uh, question. Please. Personally, I, uh, I think that, you know, good relations between leaders is uh, important and it's nice to have, but it's not the main thing. The main thing is the interest, the interest that each leader uh, see for his uh, state, his country, and the ideology, uh, if you want. Uh, by the way, Begin was asked, why didn't you uh, tell the Americans that we are going to do it? So he said, I was going to do it. And I didn't want to do it uh, after asking them, and they would say no. Um, and I think that uh, during the Obama administration, uh, vice uh, versus uh, Netanyahu uh, government here, uh, the whole world view was different. Right. Um, so they, they couldn't come to a common ground. Yeah, you know, we upset them here, they upset us there, uh, but the gap, uh, uh, wasn't because they didn't like each other. Maybe they didn't like each other because of the gap of uh, uh, in, in viewing the situation in the region and what should uh, be the policy of the United States and Israel at that time. Right. I mean, just as an aside, I, obviously, I don't want to spend too long on this, but as you're here, um, the prime minister that you worked for, Yitzhak Shamir, had a famously frosty relationship with uh, George Bush Sr., right? That's true. And uh, many times, by the way, uh, Baker, the Secretary of State at the time, uh, used to say to Itzhak Shamir, you think that uh, I am uh, tough. If you would go and speak to my boss, <laughs> you would get much worse. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, Herty, I also want to ask you, um, two people have asked if you can actually tell us, if you can actually um, sort of uh, fulfill the, the promise of the, of the hint that you left earlier when you said that now we know who leaked the information um, to, uh, that, that uh, Perez found out about uh, the date of the thing. Is that, is that something you're willing to say or you'd rather not? Yeah, yeah, it, it was published, so I, uh, okay. I won't tell uh, state secret. Uh, there was a... Um, Colonel in the um, in um, the atomic um, committee in Israel. Uh, he later he he was a physicist. Um, and now I, I, I it skips his name, but later on he became a member of Knesset from Meretz. Uh, and he Uzi uh, told her, who Uzi Evan. Uzi Evan, right, Uzi Evan, yeah. Um, and he told Paris, he, he was against it, against uh, activity, and he thought maybe Paris would uh, be able to convince, and he uh, told Paris. Wow, okay. Um, there's a, Yaakov, uh, here's a question which maybe you can answer um, based on your, not just uh, the research that you've done around Around Syria, around the Syria um, issue, but also Iran and your time as a as a military uh, reporter. Um, the question is: Was there ever a time in the past years when such a blow could have been struck at Iran, or is it like now? Now we know. We know. We've heard all about how it's so much. It's so much more difficult than Syria or Iraq, as Herty said. 
Um, the nuclear facilities are, are dispersed around the country, they're underground. Was there a point when we could have struck militarily and we just missed the chance? I don't think we missed the chance. I think we made a decision not to do it, right? There were two uh, opportunities or two times when the attack option was placed on the table in a, in, a, in, a more, in a serious way. One was in 2010 and again in 2012. In 2010, in what's now known as, a, as quite a famous story, the Prime Minister Netanyahu at the time and uh, Defense Minister Ehud Barak at the time asked the IDF to begin preparations for a military strike at the end of a, of a security cabinet meeting that was taking place at the Mossad headquarters near just north of Tel Aviv. And uh, both the chief of staff, who was then Gabi Ashkenazi, currently Israel's foreign minister, as well as Mayor Dagan, who was the, then the head of the Mossad, the late Mayor Dagan, put, were, were very much opposed to attacking at the time. And uh, without their support, the prime minister had to basically step, step down. In 2012, it, they did not have the uh, support of the security cabinet. And uh, if in 2010, he might've been able to convince members of the security cabinet in 2012, he could no longer convince members of the security cabinet. So um, th that's just part of the checks and balances in the country, but also then there, it seemed that the prime minister was, was very serious of, of launching a strike against Iran. I think that when it comes to Iran, what has always been the working assumption in Israel is that the Air Force primarily, which would probably carry the greatest load in, in such a strike or attack, um, play the biggest role, would, would be able to carry it out and cause some back Iran's nuclear program for a period of time, right? Like, like Hertzi had mentioned, Iran is, is a different animal, right? Yes, it's a nuclear program, but if, if Osirak was one facility above ground, if Al-Kibar, the nuclear reactor in Syria, was one facility above ground, the Iranians have learned their lesson from these two experiences and have scattered their facilities around the country. And some of them have been built deep underground like in Natanz or Qom, um, Fordo, the facility near Qom. So th th this is a different uh, uh, operation. With that said, the Air Force does believe it has the, ca the capability to destroy enough and damage enough to set back the Iranians and cause them enough damage. But the Iranians are very advanced in their program today. They have the technical know-how, right? Uh, we saw the recent assassination in November of Mohsan uh, Fracharzideh, the top nuclear scientist, which while a blow to Iran's uh, continued development of a nuclear program, that's not what's going to stop them if they want to continue to, to advance. So I think that it's, it's not a question necessarily of capability, it's more a question of uh, readiness and the, the ability to make that tough, tough, tough decision to do it. And when is the right time to make that decision? And of course, the, the response, that there's no possibility that Iran could pretend not to know about it as Syria did. And there's no possibility, as, with the case with, as was the case with Iraq, that there was no capacity for, for response, right? Because Iran can respond with, through, through Hezbollah and other means, right? For sure, and I think, you know, Hezbollah today with its 100,000 plus rockets and missiles that cover the state of Israel, Iran, with which is believed within the IDF today, this is from what I hear recently, has close to 1,000 missiles capable of reaching the state of Israel today. Uh, th this is a lot to cause us damage, but, but so th the question really comes down to, and I think that, you know, what, what Begin did, which later became known as the Begin Doctrine, and then what Omer did, in mind and further solidifying this uh, doctrine as something that we will continue. The question is, wh when is that point with Iran, right? So if tomorrow the Iranians, we find out that Iran has now, is now enriching uranium to 90% levels, which is military grade, has assembled the weapons team, they're building the bomb, and it's a matter of weeks or months, I believe that Israel, no matter who the prime minister is, will have, well, that, you know, I take that back. There may be some people who won't, but this prime minister uh, would have no choice but to take some action, right? Um, but as long as that's not happening, 
then you will want to keep off and stave off that uh, that that war that's going to come, and because it's going to be a bad war, and and you want to try to prevent that for as long as possible and hope that there's some other solution. I think that that's what Israel has done responsibly until now, right? The, the strike should be the last resort, but it should always be on the table. Thank you, Yako. Um, we, we're gonna. I think we're gonna close. Um, Hertzi, do you have some closing words? Um, for our audience, especially as we're, we're commemorating Menachem Begin and thinking about his contribution to the state of Israel and perhaps particularly in, in, in this event, his contribution to Israel's security. Um, I believe that the contribution of Menachem Begin to the state of Israel is much beyond uh, uh, the decision which was a historic decision to attack the nuclear reactor in Iraq. Um, because begging change the Israeli uh, geostrategic situation by uh, signing the peace with Egypt. Uh, that uh, for sure uh, uh, contributes tremendously to the situation of the state of Israel. And Menachem Begin uh, reshaped Israel's society uh, in, in many ways, which I won't go into it. Um, so I, I believe that uh, uh, the fact that Menachem Begin is the most quoted and the most present uh, uh, prime minister, late prime minister in the public arena of Israel today, it's due to the fact that he really uh, reshaped Israel. Um, David Ben-Gurion shaped Israel in 1948 as the first uh, prime minister of the state of Israel. Begin during his term of six years reshaped Israel in, in every aspect of, uh, of the state uh, uh, life. Um, and because of that, and because of the uh, model of leadership that we can learn from him, uh, I believe that uh, he should be learned and, and be an inspiration for current uh, generation of leaders and the next generation of leaders as well. Thank you, Herti. And uh, yeah, I think we, we all concur. And as, as Yaakov uh, intimated at the beginning, I think as we, as we contemplate um, another set of elections, we can, uh, we, we, we should only hope and pray for, for leaders come, that come close to begging to stature and abilities and integrity. Um, I want to thank uh, Yaakov Katz and Hatsum Markov very much uh, for this fantastic uh, uh, evening and, and exposition of their, uh, of their experiences and their, their uh, wisdom. Um, I, um, as always, I, I, I recommend the, the Begin Center to everyone, particularly with Herzl Makov on the, on the meeting. I should do so with, uh, with additional... Um, with du <laughs> additional duly call. noted, Paul. Sorry? It's duly noted. Duly noted, okay, this is good, this is good. Um, um, my, uh, I wrote my uh, email address in the chat, uh, paulg at begincenter.org.il. If you're not on my main list, uh, and you want to be and want to hear about all the uh, events that we have currently on Zoom in English, including these weekly, uh, these weekly uh, events on a Wednesday, uh, then email me. Uh, it's also available on our website and our Facebook page. Um, I also heartily commend Yakov's book, Shadow Strike, uh, available uh, on, on Amazon and Book Depository and, uh, and good bookstores everywhere. Um, and I thank you all and have a great uh, evening and a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good evening.